I see all my friends and colleagues here. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me here today. Um, I want to thank our Librarian of Congress, Dr. Hayden, for having us here in this beautiful hall. Thank you very much. I remember meeting your mom right here on this stage not too long ago. Um, you know, anytime I come here, I can't help but think back to this pivotal time in my life. Uh, it was the summer of 2012. I was about to speak at a local Chamber of Commerce uh, group when I got this phone call, right up there in the reading room, which is what many of us members of Congress go to. And the phone call was from Beth Myers from the Romney campaign. And at this point, you know, I knew that I was being vetted for vice president, but I hadn't heard anything. I didn't know how serious this was. I was kind of, I didn't think they'd pick a guy from the House anyway. So Beth starts to walk me through how I would need to fly up to Boston incognito. She goes through all these logistics of what is about to occur, and it just starts occurring to me that my life, my family's life, is about to change dramatically. And that call was right outside that door there. We hang up. I go up to the reading room and give that speech. Uh, and then I realize I've got to go vote on the floor. Uh, it was the last votes before the August recess. So at this very moment, when I want to be alone with my thoughts, I, want to, I walk right into a swarm of colleagues and reporters just keeping mum. Um, <clears throat> it's one of those inflection points you just remember at certain crossroads in your life. Uh, this building, that moment, it reminds me right now uh, that your plan, your direction, can change in an instant. I've had a number of improbable turns in my life. I don't know what's next. But before I go, I am grateful to have the chance to share a few thoughts and to say goodbye. I'm grateful to say goodbye to you, to this job, and to this incredible institution we call the House of Representatives. <clears throat> Long time ago, I came here to Capitol Hill as an intern for one semester in college. The plan was pretty simple. One semester here in Washington, learn something, that's it. Since then, I have been surrounded by some incredible people. The mentors who helped set me on the right path. Jack Kemp, Bill Bennett, Bob Woodson, the intellectual giants who guided me in the things that I wanted to pursue, the people of southern Wisconsin who gave me the chance to work for them, the staff who always made me better, the president and the vice president for being my partners in government, the colleagues who became lifelong friends, and of course my family. This whole thing started as a family affair. My mom, my brother Tobin, my sister-in-law, they ran my first campaign. My mom was my scheduler, and so <laughs> no one would turn down your mom when she calls to ask you to go speak to their group. It was, it was a great setup. <laughs> but it ends with family, too. I would not have been able to serve as speaker were it not for the sacrifices that Jana, Liza, Charlie, and Sam made. Being a husband and a dad is everything to me. So we have come a long way together in this improbable journey. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, over the years, and especially lately, I've always thought about this. I've been thinking to myself whether my dad would be proud of me. Would he be proud of what I'm doing, what I did? I lost him at a young age, before he really had a chance to shape my path in life. Uh, I don't know what he thought I would make of myself. I was too young. Uh, but this was certainly not my plan, not even close. All I keep thinking is, every time I go back to this, is what a country. I mean, what a country where someone of an unassuming Midwest upbringing gets the chance to be a part of all of this. What a country. You can pursue whatever your passion is wherever it takes you. I mean, that's the American idea, isn't it? 
The condition of your birth isn't your destiny. Your struggle isn't your destiny. It's part of your journey. You know, it's all laid out right there in the first words of the Constitution. Before first principles even. A first mission to achieve a more perfect union. We are conditioned to recognize that we are imperfect, but we are called to do better. So we revere these beautiful founding principles, liberty, free enterprise, consent to the governed, and then we go to work to apply them to the problems of the day. And we build up the country's fundamental resilience, the antibodies that protect us from whatever is going to come our way. That's how we advance the American idea. That's how we build a more confident America. As Trey said, as all my colleagues here know, I never wanted to become speaker. I was just a policy guy. I like to think I still am. But what I realize now is you don't really become speaker. At least I don't see it that way. I don't see power as something you take for yourself. It's, 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 it's not a prize to claim or a trophy to raise. You accept a temporary trust to be a steward of the greatest legislative body in the world. And it is an awesome thing. Again, just recently, the people have spoken. And soon the House will become the care of a new majority and what I know will be a spirited Republican minority. I wish the next leaders well. But it is, be, it is precisely because this is so momentary, it's because you are here for just a small part of history that you are inspired to do big things. And on this score, we have achieved a great deal. We have much to be proud of. Three years ago, when we last gathered in this hall, we began a great journey to set our nation on a better path, to move our economy from stagnation to growth, to restore our military might, and we have kept our promises. This house is the most productive we have had in at least a generation. To date, we have passed 1,175 bills, more than half of them with bipartisan support. And, because it is my duty as speaker, nearly to say this, <laughs> nearly 750 of those bills are still stuck in the United States Senate. <laughs> <laughs> but the rest of them made it into law, and that was an, that's an enormous achievement. Now, we have taken on some of the biggest challenges of our time, and we have made a great and lasting difference in the trajectory of this country. We began a historic rebuilding of our military and our national defense. We enacted new tough sanctions on some of our biggest foes. We ushered in a new career and technical education system, something so many of us have been talking about for so long. Record regulatory reform to help small businesses. A long sought expansion of domestic energy production to be followed by America's new energy dominance. To stem the tide of opioid addiction, the most significant effort against a single drug crisis in congressional history. Criminal justice reform to give more people a chance of redemption, making its way through, we're doing this all the way up to the end. A landmark crackdown on human trafficking that is already yielding results in saving lives. A VA with real accountability and finally better care for our veterans. And after years of doubt, years of the cynics saying that it could not be done, we achieved the first major overhaul of our tax code in 31 years. <laughs> Think about it, because I know I have a lot. I see Kevin back there. He's thought about this a lot. We went from the worst tax code in the industrialized world to one of the most competitive. This is something I worked on literally my entire adult life. And it's something that will help improve the lives of people for a long time to come. It's one of those sort of elusive generational reforms. It's why we do this. Now certainly, one Congress cannot solve all that ails us. Not every outcome has been perfect. But that's our great system at work. And I'm darn proud of what we've achieved together to make this a stronger and a more prosperous country. You know, my mentor, Jack Kemp, he once said that the central task of any political party is to offer people superior ideas of government. 
I see it as even more than a task or an obligation. I see it as a labor of love. Yes, you can make a career out of criticism. You can deal from that deck all day long. Many people do, and I certainly don't begrudge them that. It seems like an easy living. <laughs> but well done is always, always a better pursuit than well said, isn't it? In this business, you catch slings and arrows. It is a price that I have been happy to pay because nothing is as fulfilling as pursuing an idea that will truly make a difference in people's lives and seeing it through from start to finish. To me, that is the ultimate proving ground of politics. It is the great manifestation of this experiment in self-government. And I gotta tell you, the more you get into it, when you choose to truly engage in the process rather than merely endure it, the more you come to see that even our most complex problems are solvable. I gotta say, I leave here as convinced I was at the start that we face no challenge that can be overcome by putting pen to paper on good sound policy, by addressing head on the problems of the day. The state of politics though is another question. And frankly, that's one I don't have an answer for. You know, we have a good sense of what our politics should look like. A great clash of ideas, a civil passionate discourse through which we debate and resolve our differences. A system of government, our system doesn't just allow for that, our system depends on that. One side may win, one side may lose, we dust ourselves off and then we start anew knowing that each one fought in pursuit of their honest ideals. But today, too often, Genuine disagreement quickly gives way to intense distrust. We spend far more time trying to convict one another than we do trying to develop our own convictions. Being against someone has more currency than being for anything. And each of us, each of us has found ourselves operating on the wrong side of this equation from time to time. And all of this gets amplified by technology with an incentive structure that preys on people's fears and algorithms that play on anger, outrage has become a brand. And as with anything that gets marketed, it gets scaled up. It becomes more industrialized, more cold, more unfeeling. And that's the thing. For all the noise, there is actually less passion, less energy. We sort of default to lazy litmus tests and shop-worn denunciations. It's just emotional pablum fed through a trough of outrage. It's exhausting. It saps meaning from our politics. And it discourages good people from pursuing public service. I mean, the symptoms of it are in our face all the time. And we have to recognize that its roots run deep, deep into our culture, deep into our society today. And all of this pulls on the threads of our common humanity in what could be our unraveling. But nothing, nothing says it has to be this way. We all struggle. We are all fighting some battle in our lives. So why do we insist on fighting one another so bitterly? This kind of politics starts from a place of outrage and then seeks to tear us down from there. So. Key question, how do we get back to aspiration and inclusion? Where we start with humility and then we seek to build on that. I don't know the answer to that. What, our, what I offer today instead is something to keep in mind as we all try to navigate through this moment. Our culture is meant to be shaped not by our political institutions, but by the mediating institutions of civil society, of our community. These are the places where we come together with people of different backgrounds, churches, charities, teams, PTA meetings. It's where we build up our social capital, that currency that keeps us rooted to where we live and how we live with one another. Rediscovering that human connection is one lane on the road back to aspiration and inclusion as the guiding influences of public life. As I said, the drivers of our broken politics are more obvious than the solutions. And so this is a challenge I hope to spend more time wrestling with in my next chapter. 
I say, as I look ahead to the future, this much I know. Our complex problems are absolutely solvable. That is to say, our problems are solvable if our politics will allow it. There are three big ones in particular that I think we can tackle in the years ahead as a country. They are challenges that have vexed this country for many years. And as I leave, I recognize so much more work needs to be done. And if we get them right, we can be certain that this will be another great century for our country. You all know that finding solutions to help people lift themselves out of poverty is a personal mission for me and for many others. I think we've made a real progress here in a relatively short time. Four years ago, when our nation marked the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty, we exposed some pretty hard truths. For all the billions spent, all the bureaucracies and programs created, we barely moved the needle. But we have begun to break this monolith. New opportunity zones, which are part of tax reform, will bring more investment into distressed communities. Social impact bonds will push more private capital toward community leaders that are solving big problems whether it's helping the homeless or, or reducing recidivism. New workforce reforms, job training programs, and case management approach, those are things that will help more people move from welfare to work. We've got a long way to go, no two ways about it, but this is what I find to be so dynamic about free enterprise. It is not just about creating jobs. It's about restoring the meaning of a job, the meaning of work. It's not just about getting people off of the sidelines, it's about helping get people on the path of life. And I firmly believe that solving our poverty challenges once and for all will require not just a great undertaking, but a great rethinking of how we help the most vulnerable among us. And it begins with realizing that the best results come from within communities where solutions are tailored and targeted for people's needs. This battle will be won eye to eye, soul to soul. And Bob, thank you for showing me that. We've got great advocates for welfare reform in our party, like my friend Tim Scott. But I challenge my party here. Do not let this issue drift from your consciousness. Every life matters, and every person deserves a chance to succeed. Let us keep advancing ideas to allow people to live lives of self-determination. This is great work, and we can achieve this. Second, I believe that we can be the generation that saves our entitlement programs. Frankly, we need to be. And I acknowledge plainly that my ambitions for entitlement reforms have outpaced the political reality, and I consider this our greatest unfinished business. You know, we all know what needs to be done. Strong economic growth, which we have, and entitlement reform to address the long-term drivers of our debt. Our revenue is about to return to its 50-year average. What continues to plague us is a mandatory spending system that is deeply out of balance and unsustainable. This was the case when I came here 25 years ago, and it is the case today. Not too long ago, few were willing to recognize the scope of this problem, let alone engage on solutions. Our government wasn't even inclined to examine our long-term fiscal picture. It didn't even work that way. We had to go about changing the debate before we could begin to even try and change people's minds. You know, look, I'm proud that every year I was budget chairman we passed in the House a roadmap to balancing the budget and paying off our debt, and that Tom Price and Diane Black did the same as well. In this Congress, we came within one vote of real health care entitlement reform. Think about that. Federal health care spending, it remains the principal driver of entitlement spending. Our bill would have reformed two of our major health care programs to make them sustainable and to meet the health care needs of our country. So we have come a long way, and we are closer than people realize. And ultimately, solving this problem will require a greater degree of political will than exists today, and I regret that. But when the time comes to do this, 
and it will because it must, the path ahead will be based upon the framework that we have laid out to solve this problem. We can get there. We really can tackle this problem before it tackles us. Here's the third challenge that I think we will have to address as a country. We have to fix our broken immigration system. Right now, we are again locked in another short-term battle over one aspect of this issue. And no matter what the outcome is in the coming days, the larger problem will remain. The system will be in need of serious reform, and no less than our full potential as a nation here is at stake. But the right mix of policy solutions, it's there. Border security and interior enforcement for starters, but also a modernization of our visa system so that it makes sense for our economy and for our people, so that anyone who wants to play by the rules, work hard, and be a part of our American fabric can contribute. That includes the dreamers, those who came here through no fault of their own, and ultimately the undocumented population. In order to fix the system, you have to reset the system. In order to truly enforce the law, you have to get people right with the law. Again, we came closer in this Congress than people realize. And next year, the Supreme Court will make a ruling, and then both parties can and should go back to the table. Getting this right is an economic and moral imperative, and it would go a long way toward taking some of the venom out of our discourse. If we do these three things, make progress on poverty, fix our immigration system, and confront this debt crisis, we can make this another great century for our country. Look, I recognize that these challenges are ones we haven't made much progress on in recent years. But I gotta tell you, I am confident we still have it in us to solve them. A good friend of mine recently commented to me that amid the frenzy of politics today, he's got more faith in our system of government than ever before. As he put it, in our system, really bad ideas, they get killed. <laughs> and good ideas, they just take time. Our problems are solvable if our politics will allow it. I know it. I have seen it. In a confident America, we don't shrug our shoulders and we don't pass the buck. We roll up our sleeves and we get on with our work. A confident America leads the world too. Not with bluster, but with steady, principled action. Remember, history really does have a way of repeating itself. The democratic capitalist model again faces a generation-defining moment and test. Much of our day-to-day -day attention is focused on threats from illiberal regimes and radical Islamic extremism, as it should be. That said, I strongly urge leaders in both parties to devote more time and energy to the direct challenge that China poses to the West. China unabashedly offers an alternative in the form of an authoritarian model with a veneer of 21st century capitalism. And the sense I get from when I've been traveling overseas as speaker is that our allies wonder whether we're really still in the game here or not. When we show that our way of doing things still has juice, that we can do the most good for the most people, liberty gains ground. When we get complacent, we risk seeing more countries go in the direction of the autocrats. A confident America, it stands up to its challengers by committing to the pillars of international relations, by leading. In addition to rebuilding our military and giving our intelligence community the tools it needs, this Congress has worked to strengthen our security cooperation with our allies, particularly through NATO and the Indo-Pacific region. And good security cooperation, it goes hand in hand with strong economic ties. That's why we need to continue to pursue good free trade agreements that open up new markets to American-made products. There's a lot of effort on this front and it needs to continue. We don't want our competitors writing the rules of the road and shutting us out. And a competent America exercises clear moral leadership. We need to continue to work together to promote things like global health initiative fight human trafficking, and be a voice for the voiceless. Our economy is strong. Our military might is second to none. 
and clear American leadership in the world makes the most of both of those things. So for each of the challenges that I have discussed here today, there are people of goodwill in both parties who are ready and willing to take action. Everyone does not need to agree on everything, and everyone doesn't need to disagree on everything either. All you need is enough people of good faith willing to take up an idea. That's a good start. So what comes next? Well, we're going to have a lot of new faces around Congress next year. You know, I hear a lot of good things about this new fresh-faced guy from Utah. Um, <laughs> so here's my advice to members new and members old. This place is full of wonders and opportunity. But do your best to stay grounded. The way I think of it is either you change things or things change you. So you have to keep your sense of self. You've got to work hard around here at staying who you are. Insist on it. It's, it's what I've been praying about literally every morning since I first came here, to keep my sense of self. I knew when I took this job, I knew when I became speaker, I would become a polarizing figure. It just comes with the territory. But the one thing I leave most proud of is that I like to think I am the same person now that I was when I arrived. Still never forget that excitement that brought you here. Remember how awestruck you felt the first time you stepped on the House floor. Keep that feeling. Especially when the so-called experts tell you you need to tack this way or tack that way. <laughs> Hone your abilities to advance ideas. Sit down with people who know some, more about something than you do. Listen. Keep at it. Invest in the process. You're going to hit roadblocks? That's okay. Give yourself some grace. But timing is everything. So you have to get it right. You have to be prepared. You may not get too many shots at it. So you have to be ready when the moment of, for action demands action. And focus on good relationships with your colleagues. Get to know people on the other side of the aisle. Get to know the human side of serving with people. Build personal relationships so that it's not just transactions. You want real relationships. Having real relationships, that will help you overcome pitfalls and build trust. I see a lot of real relationships right here in front of me. And most of all, when you give your word, you have to keep your word. It's really important. Give your word only, though, if you can keep it. And keep a balanced temperament, a sense of gratitude. Which brings me to this. To everything, there is a season, and for me, this season of service is coming to a close. I have had the chance to do something that I love so much for so long, to do my small part to advance the American idea. And I leave as I came here, an optimist to the core. I wouldn't have it any other way. Nothing is impossible if you are willing to go out and fight for it. If nothing else, I simply ask you to remember one thing. We are each part of a larger story, a greater cause. And what we have here is a miracle. It really is. And this miracle has made us the most free and the most prosperous nation on earth ever. Cherish that. Marvel at that. Always dream big. Always raise your gaze. For just as remarkable as what we have achieved is what we have the capacity to do still. So here's to the people. Here's to the people's house. Here's to possibilities. Thank you for everything. God bless America. Thank you.